Two division championships were clinched during week 15. The first occurred in Minnesota. The Vikings rolled back the rug and got the last dance against the Cleveland Browns. Anticipating a Central Division title, Sam Retigliano's Browns smiled going in. But those smiles turned to frozen frowns before the cold day's end. A few miles down the road from blustery Minnesota is sunny Atlanta, Georgia, home of the NFC's surprise team. Lehman Bennett's Falcons are in an enviable position. They are masters of their own fate. A win would clinch the NFC Western Division title for the Falcons. For Steve Bartkowski, it would simply be the next step in Atlanta's Cinderella climb to the top. Bartkowski has been a major factor in Atlanta's success. William Andrews has been another. Andrews has quietly asserted himself as one of the best backs in pro football. Only Bill Walsh and the San Francisco 49ers stand in Atlanta's way. An offensive innovator and master of the passing game, Walsh may find his inexperienced defense holds the key against the Falcons. Two teams looking to nail down division titles, the Minnesota Vikings and the Atlanta Falcons. It's a doubleheader as the Cleveland Browns travel to Minnesota to battle the Vikings, while the Atlanta Falcons host the San Francisco 49ers on the NFL Game of the Week. Steve Bartkowski orchestrates one of the league's top offenses. Atlanta can wear you out with a punishing ground attack or turn your heads with an explosive passing game. San Francisco got a taste of both on the Falcons' initial drive. Inside the 10, the 49ers defense stiffened. Yardage did not come easy for Atlanta. The officials ruled that Bartkowski had crossed the plane of the end zone and the Falcons led seven to nothing. The chaotic style that marked Atlanta's grit splits is a thing of the past. The Falcons' defense is as solid and disciplined as any in the league. It would take a strong effort to shut down Joe Montana and San Francisco's conference-leading passing attack. Atlanta's defense set the tone early. Number 79, Jeff Yates, picked off an errant Montana throw as the Falcons quickly diagnosed Bill Walsh's short ball control passing game. For Walsh, the contest hinged on how often his weak defense would be on the field. Things did not look promising. Atlanta attacked the heart of the 49ers defense, and that meant William Andrews, number 31. Andrews and Lynn Kane, number 21, feasted on the Niners' soft underbelly as Atlanta met little resistance. When Bartkowski went to the air, the results were the same. But again, the 49ers' defense tightened near the goal line. This time, the Falcons came away empty. While San Francisco's defense surprised, their offense continued to be at the mercy of the Falcons.
On a fourth down, deep in 49er territory, Atlanta put 10 men on the line of scrimmage and tackled San Francisco punter Jim Miller on the four-yard line. It was only a matter of time before the 49ers' defense crumbled. But this was not that time. Bobby Leopold intercepted Steve Barkowski's pass, and another Falcon threat was averted. Late in the second quarter, Atlanta still led 7 to nothing. With a little over a minute remaining in the half, San Francisco mounted its first offensive drive of the game. Mixing Earl Cooper's running with pinpoint sideline passing, Joe Montana guided the 49ers into Atlanta territory for only the second time in the first half. With nine seconds on the clock, Ray Wershing kicked a 41-yard field goal to narrow the Falcons' lead to 7-3. On the heels of two straight wins, San Francisco had a golden opportunity to knock off one of the NFL's finest teams. Lehman Bennett was concerned. His Falcons had dominated the first half, but the only important statistic showed Atlanta ahead by a mere four points. It was time, thought Bennett, to make things happen. Steve Barkowski carried out his coach's strategy brilliantly. The NFC's worst defense against the pass was no match for the Atlanta quarterback. First, Barkowski went long to Wallace Francis. Then he concluded the swift march with a touchdown strike to Junior Miller, number 80. Atlanta began the second half the same way they did the first half, with a touchdown. They now had a 14-3 lead early in the third quarter. Could the Falcons sustain their offensive firepower, or would they continue their first half pattern of blowing easy opportunities? For the 49ers, no opportunity could be missed. Joe Montana had to put points on the board. He abandoned the short passing game for the longer, more immediate advantage. When Don Woods, number 47, ran 23 yards, the 49ers appeared to have Atlanta's number. But the Falcons' defense shut down San Francisco when they had to, and Atlanta regained possession. What followed ended any 49ers' hopes for victory. Wallace Francis' 81-yard touchdown answered two questions. Atlanta did sustain their offensive charge, and the touchdown, although only in the third quarter, virtually assured the Falcons of the NFC Western Division title. Atlanta's offense continued to manhandle the 49ers. William Andrews, number 31, took over as the fourth quarter got underway. Andrews' bullish style has accounted for over 1,000 yards in each of his two NFL seasons. Another Falcon drive ended with a Bartkowski touchdown pass. Again, the beneficiary was Wallace Francis. Atlanta suddenly led 28 to 3. The Falcons had run away from the 49ers and the rest of the NFC West. For William Andrews, the realization of a division title had not yet hit home. It
It took one more big play, this one by Atlanta's no-name defense, for the Falcons to understand that they were champions for the first time in their 15-year history. Al Richardson recovered Joe Montana's fumble in the end zone as the Falcons scored their third touchdown within a space of six minutes. Atlanta had done what no one expected them to do, win their division. A San Francisco touchdown on the final play of the game could not detract from the magnitude of the Falcons' achievement. They were indeed number one, and they had proved it against many of the best teams in the league. For the Atlanta Falcons and their fans, last Sunday's victory over the 49ers was a day to remember. temperatures remain mild in Atlanta, it was short skirt weather for the young at heart in the nation's north country. Bud Grant's Minnesota Vikings had struggled into first place in the NFC Central, but kept an eye out for the Detroit Lions, hot on their path in second place. Foremost on Grant's mind, however, was Brian Seif, the ringmaster of the NFL's magical mystery team, the Cleveland Browns. A win over the Vikings would assure the Browns of their first playoff appearance in eight years. Sipes' counterpart on the Vikings, one Tommy Kramer, has the Vikings in contention for their 11th title in 13 years. A win for Minnesota means a division title, as they meet the Cleveland Browns to paint a clearer playoff picture. It took Brian Sipe and the Browns just 10 plays to score on their first possession. The primary mover on the drive was Calvin Hill, number 35. Listed as a running back, he may be better described as a receiving back, accounting for two receptions, 33 yards, and the game's first touchdown. Another look from the end zone shows that Hill slipped into the area vacated by blitzing linebacker Matt Blair, number 59, then juggled his way to a seven-point Cleveland lead. Vikings accumulated more total first half yards than did the Browns, yet came up short in the vicinity of the end zone. While the Cleveland secondary put a damper on Sammy White, number 85, another wide receiver, Terry LeCount, number 80, personally dampened his own scoring chances. As the first half wound down, the Browns began a second scoring surge, with Brian Seip homing in on Mike Pruitt, good for 22 yards. It is this time of day when the Browns seem to come alive. When the whistle blows, the whistle in this case indicates the two-minute warning. From midfield, the Browns needed just one minute, 12 seconds to extend their lead. A heavy Minnesota rush forced Seip to hurry his throw, but when Viking quarterback Bobby Bryant overran the pass, Dave Logan, number 85, filled the hole for 41 yards to the Minnesota nine. Running back Greg Pruitt, number 34, became Sipes' sixth receiver of the afternoon, accounting for seven more yards to the Viking two. The 
Brown's final running play of the half came courtesy of Brian Seif. The two-yard sweep steered Cleveland 13 points closer to a long-awaited division crown. While the Vikings had yet to generate even one point, another Viking had equal difficulty raising a cheer from a sedate Viking crowd, whose enthusiasm was numbed by the cold, the score, or both. Choosing to de-emphasize the short passing game, Tommy Kramer teamed up long with a pair of wide receivers. Sammy White, number 85, and Ahmad Rashad, number 28. With White and Rashad covered on deep patterns and with Brown defensive end Lyle Alzado heating up the rush, Kramer looked for an escape route. In this case, escape route number 81. Rookie Joe Sensor's touchdown covered 31 yards, but the excitement was short lived. After each team exchanged field goals, the Browns retaliated in the fourth period. The big play this time found its way from Brian Sipe to wide receiver Ricky Feature, number 83. Feature's 36 yard reception brought Cleveland back into Minnesota territory opening the door for fullback Mike Pruitt, number 43. From the one yard line, Cleo Miller, number 30, scored the Browns' final touchdown of the game and put Cleveland into an unusual situation. After all, they are the cardiac kids, unaccustomed to leads of 14 points in the final period. At that moment, many Minnesota fans chose to beat the traffic home and miss the final minutes of the game. And with it, what became the miracle of Metropolitan Stadium. With less than six minutes remaining, the Vikings and Browns reversed roles as Minnesota developed a flair for the dramatic. It started innocently enough with more passes to Sammy White and Ahmad Rashad. Ted Brown, number 23, complimented Rashad's effort, scoring from seven yards out with a Tommy Kramer pass to add another ray of hope to Minnesota's comeback plans. But a blocked extra point left the Vikings eight points shy. Then it was cornerback Bobby Bryant's turn to provide the key defensive play of the game. Bryant's interception allowed the Vikings another opportunity to get on the board. They took full advantage as Ted Brown headed to the Cleveland 12-yard line. More important, he got out of bounds, stopped the clock, and set up a 12-yard touchdown toss from Kramer to Ahmad Rashad, Minnesota's bona fide big play receiver. Minnesota had struck twice in less than four minutes. It now remained for the Viking defense to get the ball back for one final play. The Browns elected to play it safe and stay on the ground, running out the final seconds. It appeared to be a safe strategy and a punt deep into Viking territory would assure a one point win. Eighty yards from the Cleveland end zone, the Minnesota miracle then took place in two parts. Part one, 
Tommy Kramer to Joe Sensor to Ted Brown. The 34-yard pickup was the result of Viking design as Sensor shoveled Kramer's pass out to a trailing Ted Brown. There was time for one last play. As Kramer faded to release a final desperation pass, the clock ran out. For the second time in two minutes, Ahmad Rashad was in the end zone. Three Viking touchdowns in five minutes. 456 passing yards for Tommy Kramer. Call it incredible, call it a miracle. The Vikings call it a win. A win that earned them the NFC Central Division title. <laughs>